That's a good one. All right, if you have your Bibles this morning, I'd like you to turn to the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 9. Luke chapter number 9. And verse number 33. The beloved physician, Luke, Luke 9, and verse 33. The divine text says, And it came to pass, as they departed from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias, not knowing what he said. Father, bless your word now. In thy name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. I can understand Peter's enthusiasm, can't you? I certainly can. This is not to be critical of Peter. The Holy Ghost did that. He said he didn't understand what he was talking about. Say, what he, to make it a tabernacle? No, that's not what the problem was. The problem was, uh, the problem was relating Christ with Moses and Elijah. That was the problem. Moses and Elijah, great in their own right, both prophets of God, both men of God, no question about it. God blessed them. God honored their ministry, undoubtedly, without question. But the one that stood on top of that mountain with them is infinitely greater than Moses and Elijah. And the Holy Ghost wanted him to understand that he didn't really understand yet what he was dealing with. And I'm afraid that most people today in the church really do not have a concept and comprehension of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. If you get that aspect right, if you get that correct, if you really get it nailed down in your mind and in your heart and in your soul as to who he is, who he really is, not what men say that he is, but who he is, it'll change everything you believe about the Bible and about the Godhead. But I want you to notice what Peter said. Probably I would have said the same thing. Peter said in verse number 33, he said, it is good for us to be here. And I can say, yes, it was good to be there. Don't you think so? I mean, you're on top of a mountain. The sun's shining brightly. The breezes blow cool. In the, in the, and, and you're there where no shadows, no valleys, no, nothing to obstruct the view. On top of that mountain, you can see off into the distance. The mountaintop experience is a wonderful thing. You may be there right now. You may be... Hey, you may have come out of a valley. You may have come out of a horrid situation. You may have been tried to the point to where you thought you'd break, but you didn't break because you found out that he's able to keep that which he has committed to him against that day. He's keeping it. The apostle says, I know he's able to keep that. Though your faith may be tested, may it be tried, though you may be pushed to the limit, but you'll find out that if it's real faith, it will stand the test. It will pass the fire. It will come out perfect, more pure than it was when it went in. And so, my friend, you can one day come back to that mountaintop and you'll shout and rejoice in the Lord God your Savior. There's no experience like that experience. And I'm sad to say that so many Christians have long since forgotten what it was like to be on top of a mountain, to be with your enemy at your feet, with standing in total victory, and looking afar off and knowing where you came from and where you're going. And knowing that the Lord God you serve, He not only is in the valley, but He's also on the mountain. There's nothing wrong with a mountaintop experience. There's nothing wrong with shouting the victory. There's nothing wrong with the power of God moving through your soul. Because that mountaintop experience, you can feed on later on. You can remember it. You can call it back to your recollection how that God blessed you with something that's not of this earth. That the power of the Holy Spirit of God moving through your soul cannot be explained with human definition. There is absolutely nothing on this earth to compare the joy of being born again. To know that your sins are forgiven. You've been washed in the blood. You're a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. There's nothing like that mountaintop experience. Amen. And it's a good one. And so I agree with Peter. It's good to be here on this mountaintop. But you can't stay there. That's the problem. And God doesn't intend for you to stay there. You see it is in the mountaintop 
that you rejoice with what you know who you are and who he is. But it's in the valley that your character is formed, that you're made into what you are. For the Bible says that when he brought Israel out of 400 years of Egyptian bondage, he said, I brought you out of an iron furnace. They'd been tried and tempted and tested. And it was in that furnace that it forged them into a nation. It was there that they came together as a people. And they were ready to leave Egypt because they were not Egyptians. Never had been, never will be. They were Israelis. They were Israelites. That was the people of God, the apple of his eye. And so my friend, right now, you may be on a mountaintop if you are. I shout with you, glory to God, hallelujah. But you might not be. In the book of Matthew, chapter number 14, verse number 30, you may be going down. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And we know that the apostle Peter, when he was looking upon the Lord, he had his eyes fixed upon him. He, was, he knew where he'd come from, where he was going. He knew what he was and what he had been. But he was looking at Jesus. If Satan can hinder your view of Christ, he will destroy your Christian walk. I want to say that again this morning. Your walk is not based on what you've done. It's not based on your relationship with each other. It's not based on all the awards men hang around your neck. It's not based on your achievements. Your Christian walk is not based on how you feel. Your Christian walk is based on the Lord Jesus Christ and what he is to you. He's everything that you ever thought he could be. He's all things that you need. He's everything that your soul ever desired. The Lord Jesus can satisfy you in ways that nothing else could ever do that. All of the things in the Old Testament that God required, he fulfilled in Christ. Every moment of righteousness that he demanded of the people it is now the righteousness of Jesus Christ all the blood that was sacrificed at the tabernacle and at the temple to wash away sin could not do it but the blood of Christ can take away your sin that Israelite in the Old Testament never had the peace he never had that assurance he never had that foundation like you can have in the Lord Jesus Christ for he gives his, his people rest and there is peace and there is a foundation for the saints of God your life is hid with Christ in God his faith is the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ for me to live is Christ and to die is gain I'm trying to tell you that there is absolutely nothing in the Christian life that can be done outside of Christ he's everything that we are or ever hope to be and all of our strength and all of our life comes from him but Peter took his eyes off of him and it was amazing at how quickly he began to fall I know he was on water but that's the way life is anyway. Some Christians have made it well for a long time. But when trouble comes, they take their eyes off of Jesus. They start looking at their troubles. Look past your trouble and look at him. And you'll be amazed at how you'll come up through whatever comes your way. But down he went. Are you drifting from him today, dear friend? Have you noticed now that that fire's gone from your soul? Do you no longer sing praises to him? How long has it been since you prayed? You never read his words. You never commune with him. You don't talk to him. And you're losing that desire to live for him other things have taken up your life my friend your days are filled with stuff and not Jesus your life now is about stuff and not Jesus or things and not Jesus or places and not Jesus and you're beginning to drift and you know you're drifting and you can't stop it well you can't stop it but he can take him anew in your life look again at him lift him up where he belongs he said if I be lifted up from the earth I will draw all men in unto me. The secret of the Christian life is Jesus. The secret of victory is Jesus. The secret of this world is Jesus. He's ever on your mind. You live for him. You think about him. You talk about him. You pray to him. It's all about Jesus. Amen. Paul said, for to me to live. He said, for to me to live. You understand that? For to me. Paul said, life to me is Christ. And to die has gain. If death comes your way, it's not death. It's simply a door that opens into a world far better than this one. Are you sinking? Are you going down? Are you going down? Notice where you could find yourself. In the book of Judges, chapter number 16, verse 21. You may have already come down and hit bottom. Judges chapter 16 verse 21. 
The Bible said the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass and he did grind in the prison house. I can't help but think in the New Testament book of Acts when Philip was up north preaching the gospel and a great move of the Holy Ghost was taking place. Where was it that God brought him to when this Ethiopian eunuch was reading from Isaiah the prophet Isaiah chapter number 53. He was an Ethiopian eunuch under Candace, queen of Ethiopia. Where did he bring him to? Gaza. He brought him to a place of victory. The place of victory for him was the place of defeat for Samson. You see, my friend, places are not what's important. It's who is the God and Lord of that place. One man can walk and be cursed. Another one can be walking and be blessed. You understand that? I'm not cursed. I can't be cursed. This world cannot curse me. I am not subject to its law. I'm subject to the law of Christ, which is the law of life in the spirit. Romans chapter number 8. Amen. And so the Bible says in verse number 21, and bound him with fetters of brass. And listen carefully now to it. Let this sink into your soul. And he did grind in the prison house. The man who took a jawbone of an ass and killed a thousand Philistines is grinding in the prison house. The man who took hold of the gates and lifted them up, friend, he tore them off of the wall and carried those gates is grinding in the prison house. The man who was known for his strength and his separation, he was, he was separated unto God. My friend, he is now grinding in the prison house. He's hit bottom. He can't go any further down. He's grinding. He's a spectacle. I can see the Philistines as they bring their children and their wives and their family and say, let's go watch Samson today. And so they stand around there and here he is in the middle of the building and Samson goes around and around. They've got him tied up like an ox and around and around he goes. And the Philistines said, now son, this is our greatest enemy. His God at one time killed us by the thousands. But we're greater than his God. For look at him. He's grinding now. And around and around and around. Samson would go. And the little children would clap their hands and say, Grind some more for us. Samson, in the end we win. You might have won the battle, but we'll win the war. That's what the world tells you. You might have won some battles, but the world says to you, we'll win the war. Let me say something to you, world. You hear me well. I am more than conqueror through him that loved me. You hear me well today, devil, and this world, and all the hell you can throw against us. The day will come when I'll hear a shout. He'll shout my name, and I'll say goodbye to this world and to all its curse and leave it far behind me oh no I might lose some battles I might come out my friend with a few blows and bleeding but I'll guarantee you one thing the victory is mine the victory is mine it is more than mine it is his and I'm victoring Christ Jesus the Lord and he was grinding are you grinding did you fall and now you're grinding Somebody told me about a brother the other day, said he has no job any longer. He lives in a trailer. He's wearing rags and living the life of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a destitute. He's in the hog pen. He's in the bottom. And he has nowhere to go. He's at the bottom. But my friend, oh, let me hear me, hear me well. He still belongs to Jesus. He belongs to Jesus. And he'll never turn him loose. He belongs to the Son of God. He's got to get his attention. He's got to talk to his soul. I can't do it. You can't do it. But God can. One day the light will come on. One day the light will come on. And when the light comes on, he'll be reminded of who he is. Where he came from. What it's all about. I don't belong here, he'll say one day. <coughs> and we read in the book of Judges, chapter number 16, and verse number 20. It leaves you powerless. The Bible said, and she said, The Philistine be upon this Samson, and he awoke out of his sleep. Notice he's asleep. And he said, The church is asleep. The whole religious structure in America is asleep. 
asleep at slumber, sleep on, take your rest. The Lord said to his disciples, he said, what can't you not even watch with me for one hour? Just an hour. I go out and yonder and I pray. At Gethsemane, he said, I'm going to go pray. Just watch with me. In plain words, he said, I want to see you praying when I get back. I'm not asking you to go where I go. You can't go where I go. Where I fight the battle, you'd never fight it. You'd die the minute if you tried to walk where I'm going. But if you'll just watch and pray, he said, I'm going to come back. But when he came back, they weren't praying. They weren't watching. What were they doing? He said, sleep on and take your rest. The hour is at hand. It's too late now. I, 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 listen, if the light ever shines in this darkened world, it's going to shine from the church. If there's ever any salt on this earth, it's going to come from the church. It's not going to come from the government. It's not going to come from school or education. And I'm all for education. But that's not the source of the light. The source of the light is the church of the living God. And when we stop giving out the light, then we have stopped being what we are supposed to be. Men are confused. They hear what the government says. They hear what the institutions say. They hear what the business world says. And they want to know what's going on. Where's the truth? The Bible said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. If they can't find the truth in here, there is no truth to be found. And if we do not get forth and disseminate the truth from this place, shut these doors, turn the lights out, and go home and forget it. Because once we stop standing for the truth, we have no purpose in being. He said, I am the way and the life. No man comes to the Father. But notice what happens. A remarkable thing. It's ironic. It's irony. Look at verse number 20. In the book of uh, Judges chapter 16. And the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. He awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. Oh, how sad. How sad. Oh, you got big crowds. You got loud music. Oh, you got everything the world has. And you even make it better. But you wish not that the Lord has departed from you. There was a time in this country when a little old pot-bellied stove and 50 people got together in a log cabin and they got in there and they prayed and they prayed and they preached and they fellowshiped and God built this nation. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. So... You may be ready to come back. Look at Luke chapter number 15 and verse 18. In Luke chapter 15 verse 18, this young man had spent everything that he had and now he was in the pig pen. He was in the hog pen. Where'd you think you'd be? When you left your wife or you left your husband, where do you think you're going? When you throw away that which is the most precious on this earth outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, what do you think's waiting for you? When you go out here and you pick up your dope and your drugs and your and your and 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 and, 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 and your alcohol and your and your illicit sex, what do you think's waiting for you? That road will lead you somewhere. Now watch carefully. Luke 15, verse 18. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father. I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. Maybe you're ready to come back. Are you ready to come back? Have you had enough of the hog pen? Are you tired of it? Are you sick and tired of no fellowship and the deadness in your soul? Are you tired of listening to men and looking at what men say and do? Are you tired of this world's philosophy and what sin is wrecking in your life? It's destroyed your home. It's destroyed your health. It's, taken, it's destroyed your wealth. It's taken everything you got away from you. Sin, when it is finished, it will bring forth nothing but death. Are you ready to come back? You don't have to show a saved man the way back. You don't have to show him. You don't have to do that. The same road that led you away will bring you back. A man that's been born again has it all over an unsaved man. 
Because he's got an altar they don't know anything about. He knows what forgiveness is about. He knows what the power of the Holy Ghost is about. He knows what a real prayer is about. He knows what it is to walk in fellowship and communion with the Lord. And an unsaved man has no idea. This is why an unsaved man in the Bible many times needs somebody to lead him, guide him. Like the Ethiopian eunuch, how should I? Philip said, understandest thou what thou readest? He's reading Isaiah 53. The, the eunuch said, how can I accept some man? What? Show me. But if you're born again by the grace of God, you don't need a man to show you, lead you, or do anything. You know exactly where you left him and when to come back. And the road that led you away will bring you back. The road of doubt, the road when you got mad, the road when you got hurt, somebody stabbed you in back in church, you thought you were tough and you thought you could handle it and you had to dabble a little bit in something that was forbidden and that thing led to something else which led to something else which led to something else. That road will bring you right back. How do you mean, preacher? Every step you take, you confess what you've done and confess where you've been and tell him you love him and you want him to forgive you and cleanse you. Every step you take, you're saying you're rebuking what I am, where I am, what I've done. I rebuke you in the name of the Lord. That's not what I am. And you come back to him. Wouldn't you come back? You know, it's a wonderful thing to see a backslidden Christian get their joy renewed and come back to the Lord. I love to see that. I do. Now, if you, if you are a legalistic Pharisee, if you're the elder brother, you don't like that. Because it takes, away from, it takes away from your notoriety. Because you feast off of people knowing how good you are and how great you are and what you've accomplished. And now all of a sudden here they're paying all their attention to this old sorry low down dog's been out there. He's been, he or she's been out in the world. They've been living an ungodly life. They got the stench of hell all over them. But they're coming back. They're coming back. They're coming back. And when they come back, if you ever knew what grace was, if you ever understood grace, grace is a wonderful thing. If you ever understood grace, grace opens the door for that sinner to walk through. Grace says, I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. I'll forgive you. I'll cleanse you in the blood of Christ. Grace is indiscriminate. Grace is a marvelous thing. And grace opens the door for faith. And once grace is administered, faith begins to reach up and take hold of what you could never see or understand before. Grace, 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 the grace of God. The matchless grace of God. You say, preacher, you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You have no idea the sins that I've committed. I'm not the one forgiving you. I'm not the one that died for you. I don't need to know. But the one who did already knows. And all he wants you to do is confess it. To him, not me. Him. Don't ever walk into some booth somewhere and have some man stick his ear up there and you give him an auricular confession or some confession of all your sin. He's not, he doesn't rate that. He's not that big. No man's that big. When you confess your sins, you confess them to God and him alone. And when you do come back, he'll take you back. Yeah, but I, you don't, you, I, I just don't believe he can, preacher. He can't take me back, preacher. I, I made promises to him and I broke them. I told him I'd do this and I didn't do it. I, I lived for him for a while, preacher, but you just wouldn't believe how I blasphemed him and how deep into sin I've sunk. He won't take me back, preacher. He can't. Yes, he can. Yes, he can. You see, the grace of God is, is based on something. It's not, it's not based on just emotionalism and an, and an easy will on God's part. It's based on a sacrifice. The grace of God is built upon a blood sacrifice at the cross at Calvary. That gives him the legal right to administer grace to you and bring you back. Because by God's holiness, he can't forgive you of sin. By his holiness, he can't even bring you back. By his holiness, he can't even touch you and look on you. But his son made it possible for grace to bring you right into his presence. Amen. Because everything he accepted in his son, you get the benefit of it when you come to him. You understand, please, once again, when you come to the Lord, he's not accepting you. 
He's accepting His Son. You're in His Son. We are accepted in the Beloved. We're not accepted individually. We're accepted in the Beloved. So for Him to reject me, He would have to reject Christ. And He ain't about to do that. <laughs> he ain't about to do that. This is my beloved Son, He said, in whom I am well pleased. <laughs> And I take hold of that and I say, Lord Jesus, I'm so glad that it's you that makes all the difference. It's you that pleased the Father. It's you the Father accepts. It's you that makes a way possible into the presence of the Lord. Lord Jesus, I want in you. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> all right. Then Acts chapter number nine. I got two more and I'll close this morning. Acts chapter number 9 and verse number 6. Are you here? He trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? That's a good question. <laughs> what do you want me to do, Lord? Well, he said back to me, he said, Big Mouth, I want you up there in the pulpit preaching. I said, all right, <laughs> I'll preach. <laughs> I'll preach. I'm doing what he told me to do. What did he tell you to do? What wilt thou have me do? We got men that go here to the jail. They go up here to the, on Maloney Road, Maloneyville Road. They go to the retention center, detention center up there. And they go up there and preach to those inmates every week, faithfully taking the word of God. That's what God called them to do. Go out here and hand out tracts. Some people preach on the street. Street corners and give God's word out. That's what God would have them do. What wilt thou have me to do? What will you have him? What, what will he have you do? And how many of you in this house this morning have a gift from God? And you've dug a hole and buried it. When one man tries to do everything, that man is either arrogant or ignorant. There is no one man on the face of this earth that can do everything. God didn't intend it to be that. You read 1 Corinthians 12 very carefully and you'll find out no one believer in the body of Christ has all the body and all the gifts. No, sir. There are things that I cannot do that you can do. There are places God has not called me, but he's called you. There are places God has called me, but he didn't call you. Every one of us has to make our election and calling sure. What did God call you to do? And then finally, in 2 Timothy chapter number 4 and verse number 7, 2 Timothy 4, 7, we read these words. The apostle said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. That's, that's a big deal. Did you see the car chase out there somewhere out? I don't know where it was. Somewhere out was on Fox. The law was chasing this car. And they chased him up into the, out in the field. And this guy jumped out of it. And he jumped out of the car. And the helicopter, of course, you know anymore. If you're running from the law, you've got a helicopter. You can't outrun the helicopter. And it was, it was videoing him when he got out of this car. He had a handgun in his hand. He eventually wound up putting a gun to his head and finishing his life. And they, and they showed it on Fox. And they tried to cut away because they had no idea that was going to happen. They didn't want to show a live suicide. But it happened. And people saw it. And then they apologized for it. Fox did. And, of course, you know, this is a news media. It's a, it's a news gathering agency. I'm not criticizing them. But I thought to myself, that's a young man. He's young. He's young. And he put a gun to his head. And he ended his life. He finished his course. It was over for him. Is that where you'll finish yours? Think about it. How will you finish your course? The other day we got a, we got a thing from Randy Pike. And it, he, finished, he had finished his, uh, uh, this, uh, this, this latest book that he wrote. Uh, I think it was a Harmony of the Gospels, wasn't it? And he'd finished that. And I, I say this for you right now. You ought to, if, you ought to, you ought to read what he has to say. He wrote a, Randy Pike wrote, I've got, a, I've got his book, it's about, it's about that thick, A History of Communism in South Africa. It's a wonderful book. It's remarkable. An enormous amount of research went into that book. Well, Randy Pike is well qualified to do that. Well qualified. 
But here's what he said when he finished the, when he finished the, uh, the uh, harmony of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, he's not the first one to do that. There are many harmonies out there, but, but, but this is his. And uh, he said, my work is done. That's what he said. Did anybody see that? Did anybody catch that when he put that on there? In other words, I'll not be writing any more books. I'm finished. God gave him peace that his work was done. Yeah. It was over. It's finished. His time's up. He won't live this life again. He, whatever he's done, he's done. You don't get two chances at it. You don't get two. You just get one in this life. You know. And what, whatever you do is going to go with you to the judgment seat of Christ. Now, of course, you're going to live on through eternity, but you're not going to live again on this earth this life. You'll have an opportunity to serve him now. And that's it. I finished my course. How did he finish it? Well, I know how he started, and I know how I finished it. <laughs> he, wrote, he wrote the biggest part of the New Testament. And I'm going to tell you right now, folks, if it wasn't for the Apostle Paul, you wouldn't understand the cross. You really wouldn't. You wouldn't understand justification. You wouldn't understand redemption. You wouldn't understand the blood atonement. He's the man who spelled it all out. The Apostle Paul. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John record it. But Paul spelled it out. He developed it. So he finished his course. He finished his course. Have you finished your course? God hadn't told me yet that I'm done. My body tells me I'm done every once in a while, but God hadn't told me I'm done. Finish your course. I got up here this morning sick as a dog. I said, Lord, give me strength. I can't breathe. I'm getting to where I can't sleep at night. So I'm going to the doctor tomorrow. Let him check me out. I'm, as far as I know, I might be walking pneumonia. I don't know. I don't want any pity. Just pray for me. Pray for me. My breath's gone, but God gave me the ability to preach. Why? Because that's what he called me to do. That's what I'm supposed to do. I could have shirked it off and said, no, I'll let somebody else do it. I said, no, I'm going to do it because I need to be up there preaching. This is what God called me to do. I'm going to do what I'm called to do. But I'm going to the doctor. Use the doctors. Trust the Lord. I want him to listen to my lungs because I can't get a deep breath. And you ever try that sometime laying on your back and try to sleep? I get up every morning at 1.30 now. I haven't had a full night's sleep in three weeks. Imagine what it is to go all day like a zombie. Your eyes are bloodshot and red and burning. Your, your mind is muddled. If you don't rest, you see that's the, the, whatever the problem is exacerbates itself in doing that when you can't sleep, which creates all kinds of other problems. So it's time to go to the doc. I've prayed over it. I've uh, asked God to heal it. And so far he hadn't, but that's okay. I'm not blaming him. I'm not through with my course yet. I haven't finished it. <laughs> I'm not done. When I'm done, he'll let me know. And I'm going to tell you something right now. There's no doubt in my mind and my soul about it. When I'm done and he's done with me and I'm done, if the Lord hadn't come back and he wants me to go, I'm gone. <laughs> I'm gone. I'm gone. Gone, gone. No fear of death. Because I've thought two or three times the last few days I'm going to die. <clears throat> but no fear. No fear. Have you finished your course? Let's stand up this morning. i give you an opportunity if you'd like to come down here and pray. Talk to the Lord. The Bible said endure hardness is a good soldier of Jesus Christ. It can't always be mountaintop. It can't always be feel good. It can't always be an easy experience. You look at Brother Silvius over here hobbling around. He's got a hole as big as a softball taken out of the side of his foot. But here he is. He wants to be in here. I respect him for that. I respect him for it. It's not easy. It's not easy. Don't let your body, don't let your body control your life. You've got to give it to the Lord. What do we got, brother? 384 in your all American church in. So I'm going to anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And I want somebody to anoint me with oil this morning in the name of the Lord. So I'm going to get down with Samuel, and I'd like to get an ordained minister. If you'll take this bottle right here and anoint Samuel and anoint me. Roger. Come up here, brother. We'll get down here. You anoint us, brother. 
Samuel, yes, me, and your sister. Out here.